Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar with eLotus, your leading provider of TCM continuing education. We have been hosting educational courses for over two decades and we are proud to be your trusted source of premium CEU content with over 200 speakers, 700 courses, and 3,000 hours of CEUs. My name is Myra Chen, and if you weren't here yesterday, you are probably wondering, who is this new person? I am the niece of Dr. John and Tina Chen and have just enrolled in a TCM school this year. I hope to enrich myself with the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors and also the great doctors of today so I can carry on the torch and continue to spread the pearls of Chinese medicine worldwide. You are probably also wondering, where is Donna? Well, she is right there training me. <laughs> Aside from my family, she is my biggest mentor, and I am very fortunate and grateful to have her coaching me today and to be your MC and host for this event. This is my second webinar, so if I make a mistake, please excuse me. How many of you are new to Master Tongue's acupuncture? Please type yes into the chat room. Okay, that's great. You will learn a lot today. In case you are not familiar with all of the tongue points, we have on the core tab section of our elotus.org website all of Master Tongue's 300 some points in detail. You can even enter the condition in which you don't know what points to use in the search section and the system will display all the tongue points that can help you with that condition. Donna will help me put the link into the chat room for you. Today's webinar is Regulating Endocrine Dysfunctions with Tongues Acupuncture presented by Dr. Henry McCann. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few items to familiarize you with our webinars and how they work. Today's webinar will be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time, and we will have four breaks and lunch is from 1 to 2 p.m. For lecture notes, download them directly from the blue course access page in your eLotus account. To use the webinar chat room, set your chat preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're typing and be a part of the conversation. To ask the speaker a question, enter your question into the Q&A box. And finally, the quiz and the video replay. You will be notified by email tomorrow once they are available. Our speaker today is Dr. Henry McCann, who is joining us from New Jersey. Dr. McCann has taught several master tongue classes with us on the eLotus platform. So if you have enjoyed today's class and want to further your learning, please take a look at his other courses available at eLotus.org. Dr. Henry McCann has also written master tongue books. He is the co-author of Practical Atlas of Tongues Acupuncture, the author of Pricking the Vessels Bloodletting Therapy in Chinese Medicine. And to add one more thing to his resume, he is a member at the Pacific College of Health and Science in New York, where he teaches medical classics as well as other doctoral degree programs in the U.S. Now let's begin today's class. Dr. McCann, please take over the class now. Would you share your PowerPoint, please? morning. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction again. And considering it's only your second time, uh, second webinar, you did just fine. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here uh, yet once again. Um, so especially good morning to those of you who are uh, joining us from yesterday or, or Saturday all day. We like to do all these all day marathon classes. Um, and I know it's 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 a long time sitting in one place to digest a lot of information in a short period of time. And for those of you in the future who are watching this as a recording, uh, welcome certainly. Even though you you, you weren't here live, uh, it's you are also appreciated as participants in this webinar. Whether of course, the, very nice to have the live people, but also nice to have the recorded people sometime in the future. So. Hello to the future from the past. Whenever you're logging in uh, on this uh, on this recording, uh, okay. So today the um, <clears throat> the today the topic is going to be looking at uh, endocrine uh, disorders through the lens of Dong's acupuncture. Although we'll be talking a bit about some of the biomedical background of endocrine disorders, because again, it's you know the environment in which we live and practice is an environment in which Western medicine is a particularly, obviously it's a dominant uh, modality. 
The other reason why it's important for us to understand that, understand this is because, you know, certainly I do believe that Chinese medicine, and I practice Chinese medicine, right? I, I don't, uh, I don't pretend to practice really any Western medicine, but the one of the reasons why uh, Western medical understanding of, of some of the things that we're going to be talking about is important is because it helps us understand natural course of disease, and then it helps us uh, gauge progress, right? So when we're treating patients, you know, in China 200 years ago, China 500 years ago, certainly in China 2,000 years ago when the Neijing was written, no one could measure blood uh, sugar numbers, right? It was not something that was possible. So you, the, the measurement of things like blood sugar levels will help us guide our patients, our diabetic patients in this case, in terms of how they're doing. So it, it gives us a really good understanding in a, in a, a sort of a hard piece of data as a gauge of success over time, right? So, I mean, we can look at subjective complaints, but also objective measures are very useful in gauging what we're doing, right? And so it's important for us as healthcare providers today, and you all are professional healthcare providers, it's important for us to have an understanding, at least a basic understanding of the, the Western side of the fence. Um, the flip side is we also need an understanding of the, the East Asian medicine, the Chinese medicine, Sometimes I call it TCM as short, uh, even though when I say TCM, I don't always necessarily mean TCM as in modern TCM. Um, we need to understand both perspectives. And so we we live in a world where we have to wear both hats um, and uh, put them back on and off interchangeably to some extent. So we'll be doing, uh, the, the main focus obviously is not Western medicine. Um, I assume that all of you who've gone through a Chinese medicine training program have had a background in what endocrine system is, what endocrinology is, you know, so some of the basic uh, parameters and categories of the various different disease presentations that we'll be looking at today. Um, certainly, uh, in the if you go to the end in the references, references and select literature, I gave you, and throughout you'll see adequate references that if you really want more information from the Western perspective, you can you can you can find it right. So it shouldn't be too hard. Um, the other thing I will say is that. Uh, as we're going through material today, we have a relatively short time to do a really big topic. You know, any of the topics we do could easily be semester-long courses uh, in, in, in a very real way, right? So yesterday, uh, for those of you watching from the future, yesterday we did uh, men's health with Dong's acupuncture, which is a big topic. Endocrine disorders and endocrine dysfunction is also a, a really big topic. And each of these one-day lectures could easily be extended out to a, like a semester-long course if we really wanted to go in depth. So we're going to go fast. Um, I will try to keep things as evenly paced as possible throughout the day, so that at the end we don't uh, we don't we don't uh, speed up the end to the last half of the class. Um, I'll try to do the best I can to pace. Obviously, everyone's in a different place where they are in, in the understanding of the material. Some people may feel a little, this is going a little too fast. Some people may feel it's going a little too slow, but I'll try to do my best to get sort of in the middle for what I feel is majority level of people. The other thing I will say is that today is really intended to be an intermediary, uh, intermediate level course. I'm going to assume that most of you have at least some basic familiarity with Dong's acupuncture. Um, we're not going to go in fine detail over all the basic theory. Um, I will take some time throughout to review very quickly some basic theory because basic concepts are obviously important. Um, some of the points that I may go through them quickly. And so if you're if you are unfamiliar or brand new to Dong's acupuncture, you will have to do some homework on your own. Um, and so we have the link that was presented in the chat room. You can go look at some uh, points. There are plenty of other uh, really excellent introductory level classes on Dong's acupuncture here on eLotus. Some that I've taught, some that uh, other people have taught, they're, 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 there's quite a few, and I would encourage you to go back and take a look at those. So if you are brand new, um, I think you will still get something significant out of today's lecture, uh, so I'm not worried about that. Um, I'm not saying that, that at all. You'll definitely come out with some useful information, um, but it means you will definitely have to do some more homework because we're going to be going through things relatively quick, quickly with the assumption that you have some at least basic concept of what we're talking about. That said, acupuncture is acupuncture, right? So uh, Dong's acupuncture is special and it's not special at the same time. It is special, obviously. I like it. It is what I use in my clinical practice. And so certainly I, everyone should know that this is the majority of what I practice in, in the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not something that is 
kind of unique and just interesting that to talk about in a theoretical sense, this is something that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I have for, for a long time, for many years at this point. Um, so I, I, hopefully it's going to be that clinically useful. However, so it's special in that I find it very useful and I use it every day. It's not special in that it still doesn't escape basic concepts of yin yang, of five phases, of channel associations, of Dong Fu organ functions. So all of the basic material you've learned in TCM school, or, and again, I don't mean TCM isn't only modern TCM, but everything that you've learned in East Asian medicine training is relevant, right? It's not, this is not a system that is completely separate from everything else you ever learned. The challenge is I'm going to ask you to remember everything else you already learned. In other words, you need to know where the channels are, what the channels do, what the organs do, what are all the channel connections, what are the internal and external branches of those channels, what are the, the basic functions of the five phase, five phases, and how do they manifest in terms of the Jing Ying Shu Jing club points. All of this will become very relevant and is very relevant in terms of Dong's acupuncture. The, 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 and th this will be the end of my, uh, of, my, of my introduction and caveat before we get into the handout. The one thing I will also tell you is that in a class like this, where we're looking at a specific type of condition, um, such as endocrine disorder, or when we've done pain management, or when we've done men's health, whatever the topic is, when it's a, a disease specific topic, it's very easy to see the points that we give later on when we talk about diseases as point protocols that you should just memorize, right? So it's it's a challenge. And as a teacher, it's a challenge for me to try to get the material out there without just saying, okay, just memorize these points, do these points, and it's going to work for this biomedical disorder. Not the case. The reason we study point protocols, hopefully, is to sort of illustrate what is the mechanism behind the different disease presentations we're looking at and to give you an idea of how to treat it or what points are more are commonly used to treat it. That's not to say they're the only points or that they will work in every case. So there's no such thing as one set of points for all diabetics, right? Or one set of points for all thyroid disorder cases. Likewise, there's, there's no one point for all low back pain patients. We have to ask ourselves, what's the Zhang Fu pre uh, presentation? And in Dong's acupuncture, we care about which Zhang organ is at play, what channels are potentially uh, problematic. Um, and how do we then address those channels or those dung organs? So the idea eventually is to make the system flexible. It's not memorizing protocol. So if it sounds like I'm giving you just protocols, I'll try to do better and make it sound like I'm trying to illustrate concepts because the concepts are what are really important. The other thing we're going to be spending some time today doing, um, because this is an exercise that I find intriguing for myself, is we're going to be looking at points through the lens of specific concepts, East Asian medicine concepts. So for example, which points will work on supplementing or strengthening qi and the qi mechanism? Which points work on supplementing or holding blood? Which points work on taking care of phlegm or damp? This is also something that I find really interesting to think about uh, from a theoretical perspective, but obviously in the end, it, it's, it has to be real in the clinic. Um, I have a, as I mentioned yesterday uh, in the men's health lecture, and if you're watching us from the future, I think it was a great lecture. I had a lot of fun doing it. So I would encourage you to, the, there's a shameless plug to go and take that class a little later on. Um, I have a sort of love-hate relationship with the idea of point functions and describing points as a TCM function, like supplementing the chi or nourishing the blood. I do believe fundamentally acupuncture and herbal medicine are different in terms of how they work. And in my clinic, it is not unusual, it's probably more common than not, that when I'm looking at a patient, to some extent, I make one sort of diagnostic paradigm assumption that I use to apply acupuncture and another diagnostic paradigm function that I use when I'm applying herbs, because I do believe they are somewhat different in terms of their mechanism of action on the body. So when we're looking at a point where we're gonna talk about a point that has a chi supplementing effect. We're not going, I'm going to try to illustrate that we're not looking at that point for chi supplementation because it simply is like stomach 36 is not ginseng. All right, I, I want, I'll say that out loud because I do think that's an important concept to get across. Ginseng is great, stomach 36 is great, not exactly the same. We can see some similarities in maybe what they do, but it's definitely not the same. Stomach 36 has a chi supplementing function or a chi regulating function or a spleen stomach supplementing or regulating function precisely because it's 
channel association, the location on the channel, the underlying anatomy. And if we understand that, then we can understand the myriad functions of what stomach 36 can do. Then we can, uh, then we can also understand why stomach 36 can not only do things like supplement the spleen and stomach, but can also do things like clear fire, right? There aren't any herbs that I know of, single herbs that both have a spleen, stomach warming, supplementing, consolidating, holding effect, but also at the same time can clear heart fire, right? Maybe you do, maybe you're a better herbalist than I am, but I'm going to try to illustrate that acupuncture points have a wide variety of function precisely because, not because there's something special. I mean, they're special and they're not special. They're special because they work really well in the clinic, but they're not special because they don't exist as independent entities that are separate from the channel, the tissue, the location on the body, et cetera, right? All of that makes a big difference. And I think that that's one of the things that, for me, Dong's acupuncture illustrates but it's also something we can take into our, if you're a TCM-trained acupuncturist, still acupuncture, it still works the same way, right? So the ideas here, if you even if you never use these extra points, hopefully the ideas we're going to be talking about will help inform your other your, your other practice. Okay. So that's my, uh, those are my uh, cap of my disclaimers, my general introduction. Let's uh, let's go to the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so here we are at the beginning, the very beginning. We're gonna do a very, very quick overview of endocrine system. Uh, this is obviously a very quick overview. I would encourage you if you are less familiar with some of the Western concepts, again, to go back to one of the textbooks that I listed in the resources and uh, just read more about it. It's, there's, it, it's uh, an important thing to sort of understand. Right, so first of all, it's in, we need to know that the endocrine system is basically a network of glands, right? That's the, that's the sort of central focus of the endocrine system. And what these glands do is they produce and release hormones that really sort of control just about every body function we can imagine, really the essential body functions that keep us alive, right? For example, it regulates the body's ability to do things like digest calories. Um, so if this breaks down, we have something like diabetes as a possible uh, as a possible result. It deals with bone and other tissue growth, so we can have growth disorders um, as a possible uh, consequence of endocrine system or problems with bony tissue. It also regulates reproductive function, and we'll talk a little about reproductive function today. But for the most part. When you're looking at reproductive function, I would encourage you to take a look at other classes that focus on that. For example, we did men's health yesterday. Um, I don't know if eLotus has a class on uh, Dong's acupuncture for female reproductive health, um, but uh, if not, it's a good class to have or to take somewhere uh, if you can. What are hormones, right? So this is another important thing we need to understand. So hormones are substances that are that are produced in the body and specifically in, in glands because glands are the organs that secrete hormones, right? And where do they secrete them? They secrete them into, uh, into tissue fluid, such as blood, very importantly, blood. And what they do is they stimulate specific target cells or target tissues into doing something, into some sort of action. And that's the basic function of hormones. Um, they're different from nervous uh, function because nervous function tends to happen very quickly. Hormones, uh, you know, hormones take time once they're released by glands to get to target tissue because it has to go into general circulation. But that's the basic, that's the basic sort of mechanism of what hormones, how they work and where they're secreted from. And we'll see different types of glands that are obviously implicated in different types of endocrine disorders, right? So let's do a very, very quick review of some of the, mo the more important glands that we see in the body. Uh, and again, just a very quick overview. So first we have adrenal glands. <clears throat> the adrenal glands are two glands that sit, sit on top of either kidney. They produce hormones that help control blood sugar. They help control metabolism of protein and fat. They react to stressors like major illness or injury. They regulate blood pressure. 
they affect the reproductive system. So, you know, they're kind of important, um, but that's the adrenal glands. The hypothalamus is a part of the lower middle brain that basically tells the pituitary gland when to release hormones. Um, and so we'll talk about pituitary as sort of like the master gland uh, shortly, right? But that's basically the job of the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is, is in the head, it's in the it's lower part of the middle brain. The ovaries are the female reproductive organs that release eggs and produce sex hormones. Uh, and we'll talk just a little bit about some of that um, uh, some of that uh, later today. The islet cells in the pancreas are cells in the pancreas that uh, control the release of hor the hormones insulin and glucagon. So we'll see insulin as a obviously a, this is in the pancreas. It's a, it's a it's a it's a problem obviously with diabetes. I think most of us know that basic concept of diabetes. We'll talk a lot about diabetes today because at least in my clinic. Without a doubt, the most common endocrine disorder I see is diabetes and the, the sequela of diabetes, the other problems that can arise is diabetes. And we'll spend a lot of time not only talking about diabetes by itself, but all of the potential myriad problems that can come as a result of diabetes. We'll also talk briefly at the end about something called metabolic syndrome, which is sort of a pre-diabetes type of problem. And we'll talk about pre-diabetes, the changes that are leading up, but not quite diagnosable as diabetes. So we'll, we'll get to that. We'll look at the specific diagnostic criteria for diabetes, the changes that get towards it, and then obviously how to deal with it. Um, the other thing I will say just off the top is that today we're gonna be much more acupuncture heavy. Um, some of my classes, we talk a little bit, a little bit more evenly about acupuncture and herbal medicine. Um, there's just so much, uh, and so many different varied potential ways we can treat this constellation of problems with herbal medicine. There's just not enough time to do both today. I'll certainly mention some things here and there when I think it's relevant, um, but I'm sure there are plenty of really excellent classes here on eLotus that talk more about uh, herbal medicine um, and these different types of conditions. So I'm going to leave that for other people who are better able to spend the time and to really talk about it authoritatively better than I can. The parathyroid, parathyroid, parathyroid as the name suggests, are near the thyroid. So there are four tiny glands in the neck that play a role in bone development. They deal with calcium regulation. The pineal gland is a gland found near the center of the brain. It's linked to sleep patterns. All right, so think melatonin. The pituitary gland, this is oftentimes called the master gland. And the reason why it's the master gland is because it influences many, many other glands, especially the thyroid. And so it does that by, by secreting hormones that stimulate other glands into action, right? For example, when we look at thyroid disorders, one of the, 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 the diagnostics for a thyroid problem is something called the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, right? Which is, as the name suggests, a hormone that stimulates the thyroid into doing what the thyroid's supposed to do. Uh, and so these types of stimulatory uh, hormones are things that we see um, coming out of glands such as the pituitary. The testes are the male reproductive glands that produce sperm and sex hormones. So we will talk a little bit about the uh, male hypogonadism, um, but briefly, we talked about it a lot more during the, uh, the male, the men's health class. Um, so if you want a deeper dive in terms of men's health, men's reproductive health, uh, sexual health, there's that other class we spent an entire day doing it. The thymus is a gland located in the upper chest that helps develop immune system early in life. So it's, it's more active in, in neonates and young children. The thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland in the front of the neck that controls metabolism, right? So we'll see, we will talk a bit about thyroid disorders a little bit later uh, today. So that's a very, very brief overview and a review, I'm sure, for most of you as to what some of those, those uh, glands are and what they're doing. Okay. Let's talk about causes of or types of endocrine disorders. And again, this is going to be a very, very quick overview. Uh, so we have two different types of things we can oftentimes see. We can see functional disorders of the glands. So functional disorders of the glands include a gland either hypo or hyper functioning uh, in terms of production of the hormones. So certain glands can stop producing the hormones 
in adequate amount or they can overproduce them. Um, so this brings, uh, this is this is obviously a problem that can lead to endocrine disorders. So this is the, the problem with the gland itself. Um, we can also have hormonal imbalances, that'll put that in quotes, which is basically a problem of the endocrine feedback mechanisms, which can then affect secretion of hormones. These types of things are, are these types of disorders really are problems where there's a failure of a gland to stimulate another gland to release hormones, right? That would be the, the endocrine feedback mechanisms, right? For example, we can have a problem in the hypothalamus, which can disrupt hormone production in the pituitary gland, which then can later affect thyroid disorders. This can happen from genetic conditions, also can happen from infection, can happen to injury to an endocrine gland, there are lots of different possibilities here. We also have disorders called, caused by lesions on glands, which are basically tumors or nodules that are found on glands. Oftentimes, these tumors are non-cancerous. They can be benign tumors, but the problem is not that they're cancerous, uh, not that they can, not that they 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 can spread and cause a metastasis, but rather that they basically affect a, they they trigger some sort of malfunction in the normal glandular function of the tissue on, on which it's growing, right? Um, so even a benign tumor in a gland can disrupt the gland's normal functioning, right? And that's sort of the problem there. Okay. Now let's talk about the idea of what endocrine system is, perhaps to some extent in the from the perspective of East Asian medicine. Right. Um, so this is where we we need to be to some extent cautious. It is uh, it is difficult to make oftentimes one to one correlations. So there's not one. You know, it's it's not just one channel, one organ. There is all sorts of channel involvement, all sorts of organ involvement, all sorts of all sorts of substance tissue involvement that can relate to endocrine disorders. It's tempting for us to make one-to-one -one correlations between very complex concepts in Western medicine and very concept very complex concepts in East Asian medicine, but in the end, it's oftentimes fraught with all sorts of problems. If the biggest example I can give you is if someone tells you that the Wei Qi is the immune system, run away from them, please, because it's a misunderstanding of a really complex topic of what is immune system. And it also sells short what is what does the word Wei Qi mean to us as East Asian medicine practitioners, right? Because they're not the same. There may be some overlapping function, but they're certainly not equivalent, not at all. Likewise, it's going to be difficult for us to come up with one specific equivalent. So rather than coming up with one specific equivalent, let's look at one concept, which is, it's a, it's a sort of a cop-out because it's, it's a concept that covers everything. Uh, and it's this concept of zheng, of right or upright or zheng, which means correct. So here is a, here's a quote to get us started because those of you who know me know that I can't, uh, can't help myself. We have to pull in some quotes from the early classical medical literature. This comes from the 75th chapter of the Ling Shu. So if you see an abbreviation LS and then a number that means Ling Shu in my presentations, if you see an abbreviation that says SW and then a number that means the Su Wen. So here, uh, this is uh, Huang Di saying, he's asking, he says, I've heard that among the Qi, right? There's, there's more than one Qi, Qi is multiple. There are true Qi, right Qi and evil Qi. So the, the terms he's using here, the true qi is the zheng qi, the, the right qi here is the zheng qi, and the evil qi is the xie qi. Now, I'll just give you a little caveat and say that these terms can be sometimes used interchangeably, so I'll try to describe what they're meaning in this passageway. So he says, all right, there, there, there are all these things. And then he, has, he says, okay, what's the zheng qi? What's the true qi? And Chibo replies, the true qi are, because Chibo knows it's plural, so if Chibo were to speak English, you would use the the, the plural form of the verb to be, which is are. Um, certainly in classical Chinese, it's no plural or singular, so we, we leave it up to the translator's imagination here. The true qi are the product of what is from heaven combined with the grain qi, right? The grain qi is the spleen stomach. It's the, the, the source of latter heaven. And it fills the body. The right qi, the zheng qi, so this is zheng qi is not, he's not talking about the zheng qi that we talk about as inside the body. Here, he's talking about the zheng qi as basically 
proper weather patterns. So he says the Jiangxi are the proper winds coming from a cardinal direction. So the cardinal winds here, the, the proper winds coming from a cardinal direction means the weather pattern, the external environment, the way it's supposed to happen. They are not the vacuity winds. And the vacuity winds basically are weather patterns that happen out of season and then can impact human health. And that he says the evil chi are the thieves among, among the vacuity wind that harm humans. And so sometimes these harm us. They penetrate deeply a person's center and do not leave their own accord. Right. So basically going back to this idea of chun chi or the of the true chi, this is that which is from heaven combined with the grain chi. So it's everything, right? It's it's early heaven. It's latter heaven. It's basically all of the normal functioning of the body that allows it to do what it's supposed to do. It's all of the ing, it's all of the way, it's the source, it's the function of the dung organ. When we look at Weissman uh, in Weissman's dictionary, and I've often said that uh, if you practice Chinese medicine, you should have Weissman's dictionary on your shelf, unless you read Chinese, then it doesn't matter so much, right? So Weissman talking about the zheng qi. So the zheng qi, the true qi, and the zheng qi, the upright qi, when we're talking about endogenous qi, are somewhat synonymous, right? Here, they're making somewhat of a difference, but when we're talking about it in the body, we'll talk about it as synonymous. He says the true qi, or the, the right qi, is the true qi, and especially it is used in the concept of an opposition to, to disease. So here's the important part of the definition. He says the right qi is the active aspect of all components, including the organs, the blood, the fluids, the essence, and basically all the forms of qi in maintaining health and resisting disease. Okay, I'm gonna say it again. The right qi is the active aspect of all components, including the organs, which means if we're looking at right qi as endocrine system as an aspect of right chi. I think right chi is an even bigger concept than endocrine system. That means we're going to have to look at regulating the organs, right? It's not just one type of chi. It's not just one organ. It's the organs, the blood, the fluid, the essence, and all forms of chi in how they basically maintain health and resist disease. So if anything in my book, if anything is the endocrine system, it's this or this endocrine system is an aspect of this. So what we're going to be looking at is numerous organ systems, numerous ways that we have to deal not only with the upright, but how do we how do we get rid of that which is a disease presenting pathogen in the body? So it's it's everything, right? So that's my 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 introduction to East Asian medicine and endocrine system and my apology if you wanted a simple answer. I usually tell people when you come to my classes if you're looking for an answer, you're coming to the wrong place. We're going to give ideas that help us understand the concepts. There's not one specific answer. It's just how can we better sort of think about what we're going to be treating and looking at. That's 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 my thrust as a teacher. Okay, everyone okay with that idea? Any questions? Okay. So. This is also important. Um, when we're looking at Chinese medicine, even though we ha have a disease diagnosis, it's like we have something like diabetes. Right? Again, there's no one point for diabetes. We still have to identify channels, tissues, organs, everything, which is why we have these statements in Chinese. We have Hong Bing Yi Zhi. Then we have Yi Bing Tong Zhi which means the same disease, different treatment, different disease, same treatment. Why? Because in Chinese medicine, what we're, what we're see, what we are treating here is not necessarily one specific disease name, but rather what is the pattern of disharmony. And when I say pattern of disharmony, I want to be clear that I don't just mean modern, modern TCM style zhang fu pattern differentiation. That's a possibility. But when we're looking at what channels are retreating, what tissues are retreating, what organs are retreating, are we treating one of the three jiao? Are we treating six layers in terms of shang Lun? That's all also a type of pattern diagnosis, right? 
So that's where we have this idea of Tongbing, same disease, we have each or different treatment. But then we also have different diseases, same treatment. Because it's not the disease, the disease is not unimportant, the disease is important. But it's not the most important, it's not the only thing that's important, right? If you apply Dong's acupuncture based on a disease diagnostic model without any reference to channel, to organs, to tissues, et cetera, then sometimes, like I said this yesterday in the class, it's like throwing a handful of darts at a, a dart at a dartboard across the room, closing your eyes. Sometimes you hit the dartboard, sometimes you don't, right? If you want to hit the dartboard more frequently, more, more consistently, then you practice with your eyes open. That's what I mean when we're looking at pattern of disharmony. So that's why in Dong's acupuncture, you've all seen, hopefully those of you who've seen Dong's acupuncture have seen this type of, this type of schematic diagram before, right? So we have different types of correspondences that tell us if the disease is in a certain location, a body location, let's say someone has diabetic peripheral neuropathy of the lower extremities, how can we do some sort of needle stimulation that gets a movement of chi and blood, a resonant movement of chi and blood happening in that area? Those of you who are brand new to this should know off the top of right, right off the bat that in Dong's acupuncture, the one of the primary strategies is not to use local needling. It's used in using distant needling, right? And I'm not saying distal for a region, reason, because distal means away from the periphery, away from the center towards the periphery. Sometimes we needle distally, sometimes we needle proximally, sometimes we needle superior, sometimes we needle inferior, but we're needling away from the site of disease. But the question is, how can we get the stimulus from the site of needling to the site of disease? That's what we'll talk about in terms of, or that's what we talk about when we're looking at diseased regions and holographic correspondence. What channels are we, are we treating? We have to know what channel we're treating. Either the channel the, on the exterior of the body or the channel that goes to the interior of the body, right? And then we have to choose appropriate treatment channels. We don't always needle the channel that's diseased, right? And in some cases, needling the channel that's diseased is a, in my opinion, less efficient strategy than needling channels that have an interrelationship with the diseased channel. And we can look at diseased tissues, right? So the diseased tissues, all of this we've discussed in more basic classes. This is a very quick overview. This is what leads us into potentially effective areas, channels, and points, which then we choose by inspection, palpation, and eventually get to the therapeutic point. Right? So this is what we have to look at every time we're looking at any condition, diabetes, thyroid disorder. If we have to sort of still come up with what's the most efficient point based on all of these different potential criteria. Again, points don't work because they treat a Western disease. Right? I'll say that again. Points don't work because they treat a Western disease. Points work because they stimulate channels and by stimulating channels, they end tissues, right? Because the needle is going into a tissue, going into flesh, it's going, we're bloodletting, we're needling near a, a, a tendon, we're touching the bone. Because we're stimulating channels and tissues, we are stimulating other channels, we're stimulating organs, we're stimulating all sorts of things, right? That's how acupuncture does what it does. If stomach 36 doesn't treat diabetes because it magically treats diabetes, it treats diabetes sometimes, not always, because it does all these other things at the same time. Okay. So just acupuncture can be forgiving. So sometimes, again, you can still close your eyes and hit the dartboard, but if you want to get it more consistently, you have to take all this into consideration. So let's look at, from a Chinese medicine perspective, what is some of the etiology uh, of endocrine disorders, just to get us a, uh, a sort of a, a broader idea of what we're going to be looking at. So one of the things we will see frequently are different types of constitutional insufficiency or vacuity patterns, right? these patterns of deficiency. Under this, we can see things such as internal heat due to vacuity patterns. This is something that we will see commonly. Um, for example, we'll see something like diabetic hypertension, which is not always a heat pattern, but oftentimes can be related to a heat pattern that's with, an, with, a, uh, with, a, with a concomitant uh, a, a basically simultaneous vacuity. So we see this in diabetes over time that can potentially damage the jing essence or the kidney. So this is one of the reasons why we see bloodletting as a fairly, uh, fairly important and commonly used therapy. 
It's also why we'll see a focus on kidney. The kidney is that source of Jing essence. Uh, and if it's the most yin of the five viscera, it can, also be, it can oftentimes be damaged by heat if heat is there for a long time. One of the other things I will say real quick is that if you are brand new to blood, we will talk about bloodletting blood today, because I think that when we're talking about Dong's acupuncture, you have to talk about bloodletting. I do not bleed every single patient I see. That's definitely not the case, even though I like it. It's one of my shticks. Um, but when it's useful, it's useful, right? And so it... I think that it's something that people need to be utilizing more often in the clinic. If you are not using herbal medicine, then you are going to you, you will need to do bloodletting more frequently. We'll talk more about that later. But what I want to say and make sure I say this out loud is that if you are not familiar with bloodletting, this class alone will not make you competent in bloodletting. You should take a more comprehensive course. There are plenty online. And for bloodletting, ideally, you want something in person. Uh, uh, E-Lotus is also recorded. We did a two-hour bloodletting safety class that you can either take as a continuing ed, or you can watch on YouTube for free, right? You just don't get the CU credit. So if you are doing bloodletting, um, you should do a review of safety, uh, and I would encourage you to watch that class. Uh, and again, watch it for free, but just know the material. We also see various different types of uh, Vacuity in qi, vacuity in blood, even vacuity in yang, that can also all basically feed into this internal heat type of pattern. We'll see accumulation of disease evil, such as phlegm, such as blood stasis. Uh, all of this can also lead to heat, which further damages the upright or the right qi, the yin, the blood. So when we have accumulation of disease evil, whether it be phlegm, blood stasis, et cetera, we have to address that somehow. There's oftentimes uh, damaged uh, jung chi. The damaged jung chi or the damaged right or the upright allows for the invasion by external disease evils. So it's all sort of plays in to each other. And then what we'll frequently see is a combination of internal vacuity that leads to, or, or a root vacuity that leads to branch repletion. Um, so this means that sometimes we'll need to apply needling and bloodletting or moxibustion and needling. Um, or in many cases, I do think that you will need to uh, use herbal medicine. Again, if you are not an herbalist, that's fine. Uh, but if you are not an herbalist and your patient is not taking Western medicine, I do believe in many cases you should refer out to an herbalist. Uh, which, because I, I do think that, especially for things like diabetes, I think acupuncture is great, but I do think that as lines of defense, first diet and lifestyle, most important, then potentially herbal medicines, and then acupuncture. Um, so uh, I do think that those are all important things to take, take into consideration. Okay. And speaking of uh, diet and lifestyle, let's look at uh, miscellaneous causes that lead to endocrine disorders. So this is a line from the 47th chapter of the Su Wen. Uh, and interestingly, the beginning of this line, I didn't have, I didn't put this portion in here. The beginning of this line basically is a discussion of why patients have a sweet taste in their mouth, right? So we know what this is talking about. And uh, the answer is, this is an effusion of fat and delicious food. The, this person must have frequently consumed sweet and delicious food. So when they say delicious food, right, the delicious food means really fatty, really uh, greasy, really sweet, right? Usually some sort of food that we would not suggest our patients eat on a daily basis, right? So it says, this is an effusion of fat and delicious food. The person must have frequently consumed sweet and delicious food and his diet was mostly fat. A fat diet lets man experience internal heat. Okay, there's the internal heat. Sweet food lets man have central fullness, basically an accumulation in the middle burner. Hence, this chi rises and overflows. It turns into wasting thirst, xiao ke, right? Xiao ke, wasting thirst, is something that we will see is associated especially with untreated diabetes. Right? We'll talk more about wasting thirst a little, a little bit later. Then it says, treat this with orchids, eliminate the old chi. So here we see there's a combination of heat as that damages the physical structure, right? The physical body, which is why we have wasting right? So because that's yang, the physical body is yin substance. This combines with stagnation at the same time, 
right? So we have both heat, we have damage to the physical body, we have stagnation that creates this, this shalka, which again, we can correlate frequently to diabetes or at least untreated diabetes. And it says treated with orchids, this is lan. So lan sao, orchids, includes things like pelan, which is one of the kinds of orchids we use. And what, what does this do? It's acrid, it transforms dampness in the middle burner. So this acrid flavor to it disperses stagnation. This has sort of like an acrid, very moving function. It eliminates accumulation. It, it reestablishes movement in the middle burner and gets rid of that which is old and accumulated. Right. So this is similar in action to formulas. For example, one of my fam favorite formulas is this Huo Shang Zheng Qi Tang, or Zheng Qi Tang. And we'll see that especially I use it frequently in metabolic disorders in, or in the uh, metabolic syndrome rather. So this is basically uh, goes a long way of saying essentially that proper lifestyle in general is a way to maintain strength and health of the upright, of the right chi. And again, this is to some extent one of the first lines of defense. I'll give you a short case study later that talks about this in a very real clinical way that was kind of surprising to me and the patient's regular doctors at the same time. I promise we'll get to that a little later. So as a clinician, you're going to have to be counseling your patients about what they can be doing by themselves. Now, certainly the reality is that not every patient who does what they are supposed to do will have a miraculous recovery. They still can potentially need support, and that's okay. But I'm also going to tell you that, uh, you know, I have a patient I've been treating for a long time. He has Parkinson's disease and diabetes. And the problem is we're having a hard time knowing what are neurological changes related to Parkinson's versus neurological changes related to diabetes. And he admits he doesn't watch his diet at all, at all. And his blood sugar levels are always elevated. And it's me constantly cajoling and saying, listen, you know, you have a lot of things going on. Might be worth sort of reconsidering how you're eating, how you're exercising, managing stress levels. And as a clinician, you can only do so much, but you should try at least make sure you're, you're thinking of that. Okay, so that, uh, that's one of the etiologies also, is this lifestyle and diet. We can also see various other things such as blood stasis and phlegm. These are major factors in chronic recalcitrant diseases. So this is a fun little phrase of Ch in Chinese, it's qi bing, yi bing, duo shu tan, which means that lots and lots, lots of weird, different kinds of unusual diseases are in the phlegm category, right? So something is really sort of weird, it's recalcitrant to treatment, you may make sure you're evaluating thinking about blood stasis and phlegm. Certainly, uh, Master Dong thought that blood stasis was a major component of serious disease, which is one of the, one of the reasons why there's such a heavy reliance in Dong's acupuncture on bloodletting therapy. Um, and again, if you don't want to do bloodletting therapy, that's okay, but you definitely need to be doing herbs. If you're not doing herbs, you definitely need to be doing bloodletting therapy. So we can see in Dong's acupuncture, some of the points that we will use frequently are points for bloodletting. One of the common examples is this point here, the, the outer four flowers, 77.14. This is in the vicinity of Feng Long stomach 40. It's not exactly the same, but it's close enough to the same. Remember when we're bleeding a point, we're not necessarily bleeding exactly at that point, but we're looking for something in the vicinity such as blood vessels, patchy dry skin, something that gives us an idea that there's some sort of heat or stasis present. And remember, that's the main thing that bloodletting does is it clears heat and it, it moves stasis, especially stasis at the blood level. Right. So we can use this is, you know, if you don't, if you're new to bloodletting, as long as you've taken the appropriate class that gets you confident enough to do it, and you don't know where to start, one of the points we can always think about is this point. Why? Because this point we know in TCM, this is a major phlegm point. We'll talk a little later about why it's a phlegm point. It's not a phlegm point because it's a magic thing that just treats phlegm. It's a phlegm point because of its location, because of its channel association and the underlying tissue. So we'll come back to that shortly. But it also, because it's on the Yangming channel and the Yangming is full of qi and blood, it also has the ability of clearing heat. So the nice thing about this point is it clears heat, it clears phlegm, it clears blood stasis to some extent systemically in the entire body. So if we, especially if we see blood vessels in this area, then we could potentially do bloodletting at this point. Now, one of the things we do need to keep in mind is that because, especially in some of the endocrine disorders, when they become particularly chronic, 
because we oftentimes see a combination of stasis and some sort of internal insufficiency where the patient's upright chi is depleted, we need to be careful where we're bleeding. And the preference is bloodletting of channels, which are amenable to bleeding without damaging the, the right chi, right? And so how do we do that? Luckily, of course, we have a guideline. So if we look at the Neijing, this is from the Suen. It says, this is chapter 24 of the Suen. It says, now, as far as the constant state of the human body is concerned, the Tai Yang has much blood, little chi. We're all familiar. We all memorized this at some point in school, hopefully. The Shao Yang has little blood and much chi. The Yang Ming has much chi and much blood. And then we go through the Shao Yin, the Jue Yin, and the Tai Yin. And so what this does is it gives us an idea of relatively the ratio of qi and blood. And so here's the summary chart on the next page. Note that the Ling Shu disagrees on the yin layers, um, but every source in the Suen agrees that the Tai Yang has more blood, the Xiao Yang has more qi, and the Yang Ming more qi and blood. We all know this basic concept. What chapter 24 of the Suen goes on to tell us a little later on is that what this means is that we can bleed the Taiyang channels and the Yangming channel because they have more blood with less risk of damaging the upright, even in patients with some sort of acuity pattern. So when we're, ble when we're bleeding, we are going to preferentially look at, for example, the bladder Taiyang and the stomach Yangming channels. And in fact, in Dong's acupuncture, those are the areas with the greatest distribution of zones that we would potentially do bloodletting on, right? So that's something to keep uh, in the back of your head uh, as well. Okay, everyone okay with that idea? Any questions? All right, let's look at uh, another concept in the etiology of uh, endocrine disorders. So one of the things we can see is uh, obstruction of the Sanjiao function, right? And so Sanjiao function is, you know, the Sanjiao, when I teach basic TCM theory, Sanjiao is one of those things where there are a lot, there are not, 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 not an innumerable amount of ideas, but there are definitely numerous ideas of, to, as about what exactly we're, we're talking about and what does it potentially mean. So one of the ideas of the Sanjiao is a concept that describes, sort of to put it simply, and I, I, I know all of you understand this already, sort of how are we looking at the harmonious workings of all of the areas of the body and the integration or inter, the interdependence and interrelationship between all of the organs of the body. Some theories of the Sanjiao discuss the Sanjiao being related to the dissemination of, yuan, of, of source qi through the entire body. This doesn't exist in the Neijing, just to be clear for those of you who are, uh, who are fans of the early texts. So the Neijing neither mentions source qi, nor mentions san jiao as that which disseminates source qi. This idea first happens in the Nanjing, the classic of difficulties, but it basically, it, it's still there in, in Han Dynasty medical texts. So basically when the san jiao is unobstructed, then the qi, source qi, the, the basically the upright chi in general, everything is properly disseminated. The ing and the wei are harmonious and the normal production of all the chi and blood are allowed. So it's not only the circulation, but also the production of chi and blood. Why? Think about it. Where does chi come from? Chi comes from, if we look at the suen, chi comes from the interaction of that which is happening in the middle burner, which is then brought up into the upper burner and disseminated through the entire body. What does that mean? Things are moving through the different the different burners. Blood is also an interaction between this heart involvement in blood, both production, storage, and circulation. Heart's involved, liver's involved, kidneys involved, even the lung as the disseminator of qi helps movement of blood. So we're looking at the harmonious interaction of the upper, middle, lower burner as being essential to the production, dissemination, circulation of chi, of blood, but also the normal functioning and interrelationship of the organs. Okay. So this is, you know, kind of a big deal. One of the things we have in Dong's acupuncture, 
which is somewhat important, uh, it's really kind of important, is this idea of Dalma needling, right? And so Dalma needling is needling points along a channel distribution in a way to stimulate a certain area of the body in a stronger way or to regulate function of, in some cases, the Sanjiao mechanism. So for example, this is the basic uh, definition of Dama needling. We have a couple of different Dama configurations. The most important is this vertical three needles that again is along a channel line. So for example, if we're looking at one of the, the holographic concepts that we see in Dong's acupuncture, in the small holograms, we can see that each of the long bones actually is related to the entire body. So for example, along the, the tibia, we can see that this can be broken down into upper jowl, middle jowl, lower jowl. So the example we can consider when we're looking at Dalma needling, and again, for those of you who are brand new to Dung's acupuncture, I would encourage you to, I believe there's a section on the uh, on the eLotus website that talked about Dama needling, right? I think uh, maybe Donna can put that into the chat room for those of you. And it's certainly described in, in pretty much any book on Dung's acupuncture. But what the Dama needling does, for example, is it oftentimes distributes points in a zone that can help regulate upper, middle, and lower jowl, right? So for example, the lower three emperors are roughly spleen nine, spleen six, and something in between, which means what? We're stimulating upper jowl, middle jowl, lower jowl, we can use that idea to stimulate just one of those, or we can needle the entire group so as to stimulate the, the normal function of all three jowls and get them to work harmoniously together. Okay. That's an example of one of the ways we can regulate the, the Sanja mechanism through Dong's acupuncture. For those of you who are interested in, in, a, more, in a, a bigger deep dive on the, the, the Dalma concept, uh, last year, I think it was last year, we did a, a lecture, which is here on eLotus, on the on Neijing and Nanjing treatment strategies through the lens of Dong's acupuncture. And we discussed uh, Dalma needling much more in depth in that class. And I think it was an interesting discussion. So I encourage you to go take a look at that. Not only can we use the Dalma needling concept to regulate the three jiao, we can also use uh, we can also use needling, right? Second. So we talked about this already. Right? So uh, obviously, again, one of the special features of Dong's acupuncture is this idea of regulating the, the entire body through small segments of the body. Conventional acupuncture uses a local, distant, local, adjacent, and distant needling or distal needling. And Dong's acupuncture is mostly distant needling, but we can still do local and, and distal within, dis within distant, right? We'll come back to that. So this is a quote from the ninth chapter of the Suen. It says, the first piercing makes the evil chi, the yang evils rather, come out. The second piercing makes the yin evils come out. And the third piercing lets the grain chi arrive. So here, the first, second, and third piercing usually is, is interpreted as the depth of needling. So the first piercing means superficial needling that treats the exterior of the body, that treats the upper jowl, which is why it allows yang evils to go out. The second piercing treats it's the sort of middle depth piercing that allows for transformation to happen in the middle because the middle deals with, with the, the middle depth deals with, deals with the interior, deals with regulation of disease evils on the interior especially through the moving and transforming function of the middle burner. Remember the middle burner does yun and hua movement and transformation. The third is the deepest level down to the level, level of the kidney. Here it says it lets the grain chi arrive. According to Zhang Jingyue, who is a commentator on, this, on the Suen, or this is the Ling Shi rather, he says the grain chi is synonymous with source chi. It's associated with kidney, and that's Zhang Jingyue's interpretation. So we can see that needling superficially treats the upper body, more deeply treats the middle burner, the more interior, and needle, needling most deeply treats the lower burner, treats kidney, treats that aspect. So we can also treat the three burners by relative depth of needling. We can do this at each individual point. We can do this, uh, we can do this within a Dama combination, right? One of the examples I give to illustrate this clinically 
is, uh, and I, I've, I, I've stated this in almost every class I teach because it's one of those examples I couldn't have paid someone to fake. One of my first times teaching over in Germany, we were doing a pain management lecture because guess what? This matters even with pain management sometimes. And in this pain management, uh, in this pain management lecture, we had a, a, a woman. So in the morning we did lecture, in the afternoon we did basically grand rounds. Um, and so in the grand rounds, we had a one of the patients we looked at was a middle-aged woman who had frozen shoulder, right? And so her her shoulder, she had already been getting acupuncture, so the 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 range of motion was getting better, although it was really still very stiff and very, very painful, right? So what we did with her is I chose a set of points on the hand that are called the three shoulders, which are along the first metacarpal. You can look those up in, in books or in our pain management classes. I put the needles in and I said, okay, move your shoulder around and tell me how it feels, right? Now, the, the channel associations worked, the point theoretically should have worked, um, but uh, I put the needles in, I said, move it and tell me how it feels. And she said, oh, it's no better at all. She was very chipper about it. But of course, there I was thinking, what am I missing? You know, I, so I started to panic. I thought maybe I'll take those needles out and choose a different set of points and then try it again. But my internal dialogue, dialogue kicked in and said, okay, you're missing something. The channel works, the image works, all the things in Dong's acupuncture we talked about should work, but what am I missing? So I thought to myself, what's frozen shoulder in terms of Chinese medicine? Most of us probably know that or have heard the idea that frozen shoulder is what we call 50 year shoulder, right? The Wu Shijian. Uh, in Japan, it's called 40-year shoulder, maybe because the Japanese are more stressed out. I don't know. But it's called 50-year shoulder, which means what? Which means that frozen shoulder, and we know demographically it's more common, for example, in peri- and postmenopausal women. What does it have to do with the idea of 50-year shoulder? Because it, the, the pathomechanism is oftentimes an insufficiency at level of liver and kidney where the sinews are not nourished. It's not just from an injury, per se which means when we're treating it, we have to get to lower burner. We have to get to kidney liver. So what do we do? I took the needle, I pulled it out a little bit. I didn't take it all the way out. I re-angled it and inserted it more deeply right next to the bone. And then I said, okay, move your shoulder. And it wasn't like two days later or five days later, the pain went away. It wasn't let's do trigger point needling in the shoulder to get the trigger points to go away. It was immediately the pain was gone. Why? because we treated the appropriate level of that, of that pathology. We, tr we treated the appropriate burner level, in this case, the lower burner. Get the idea? So the needling can help us target which one of the burners we're treating. We can also, when we're doing this in relationship to a DALMA combination, for example, if we're needling three points along a line, Let's say we really want to treat kidney, then we can take all three of those points and needle them deeply. Let's say we're wanting to treat all three burners, um, then we can actually vary the needling depth at the points in the Dalma group, one superficial, one middle depth, and one deep, in order to, within one Dalma group, treat upper, middle, lower burner. So we can treat upper, middle, lower burner by location along a bone or by location and depth. So the three points, the points on the thumb we did were called the sanjian, the three shoulders. Right. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about uh, the concept of supporting the upright. And then before we get to the points, we'll take a little break, uh, our, the first break for the morning. <clears throat> so we talked about this, we talked about this. Okay, so let's look, about, look at some general treatment strategies in Dong's acupuncture. And these are general treatment strategies that, uh, that, that apply to endocrine disorders, but also to all sorts of disorders, right? So not... The, the, you know, the marketing this as endocrine disorders is just uh, a device to get you to learn about acupuncture in general. Right? We'll talk about endocrine disorders, but we're still going to talk about acupuncture in general. So one of the concepts we have to take a look at or consider is this idea of supporting the right or the upright. 
So what we're the the term here we're looking at is either the Zheng Qi or the Zhen Qi. They are oftentimes used synonymously. The Zheng Qi can be also used to talk about weather patterns. It's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about all of again. We said what Weissman got. What basically Weissman defined this as. Here's the definition again. The right qi is the active aspect of all components, including the organs, the blood, the fluids, the essence, and the forms of qi, the various forms of qi, in maintaining health and resisting disease. So we need to make sure that that's still doing, doing what it's supposed to do. We can see here in the Neijing, this is from the very first chapter, the Shanggu Tianjinlun means the, abs, the, 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 truth, the treatise on the truth of heaven from very, very ancient times. It says, when essence and spirit are guarded internally, where could a disease come from, right? So in other words, if we are maintaining an essence and spirit are nothing more than symbols for yin and yang, right? When all of the yin and yang, all the organ function, everything is working as it's supposed to be working in the body, where could a disease possibly come from? So a couple of things we need to take into consideration is that the idea of supporting the upright is not the same thing as boosting immune function. Uh, we know from a Western perspective, we don't necessarily want to boost immune function for every patient, right? So, <laughs> because an overactive immune system is just as bad as an underactive immune system. Um, immunity is not upright chi. Um, so there's, I just wanna make sure I say that out loud. The most important thing that we're gonna be looking at is still basic East Asian medicine pattern diagnosis. And when we're looking at common points for supporting the upright, we're still going to need to take in consideration what is the channel, what's the tissue, what's the hologram, and I will uh, I will try to uh, I will try to sort of model that as we're as we're going through things. Um, okay, we will do a quick review of some of those concepts a little later. Actually, while we're here, rather than just delving into points, because once we start, we should we should actually just keep going. Why don't we take our first short break right here? Because we're only about uh, seven minutes away from when we're supposed to take our break. Rather than talking about just one point for a few minutes, why don't we take a little break here? Uh, and then we will come back and just really delve into points more, talk about points and why points are doing what 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 they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Any questions before we take a little breather? Why don't we come back at, let's see, it's, we're getting close to 1.15. It's uh, my time, which means it's 10.15 a.m. your time, going to be 10.15. Why don't we come back at, uh, no, 10.15 is, is too, sh too short, Donna. That's only a couple minutes. Let's come back at 10.20. Yeah, 10.20 a.m. Pacific. Okay. Good. All right, we'll take a short break, get up, stand around, move a little bit, 